Hello, I'm Janine Pipe, a writer, director and lifelong movie fan. We're not here to formally review or critique, but to celebrate our chosen subject. And there will be many spoilers, so you have been warned. But that's enough about me. I'm delighted to have three amazing guests join me today to talk about the iconic 1975 cinema classic, Jaws. First, we have my very good friend and filmmaker extraordinaire, Neil Marshall. Next, we have one of my most favourite authors and all-round Mr Nice Guy, Jonathan Jans. And last, but by no means least, welcome back to the amazing movie journalist, podcaster, TV presenter and lovely person, Alex Zane. This okay. was no boating accident. <laughs> <laughs> Straight in with the movie quotes. Awesome. OK, so we all know what Jaws is, but just in case somebody's listening that needs to be reminded, it's almost the 4th of July on Amity Island in New England, and a bloody big shark starts to ruin everyone's fun. So the police chief, an oceanographer, and a mad as a box of frogs fisherman take out a boat and kill it. That's it. That's basically what <laughs> happens. Spoiler. Those are spoilers, yeah. Sorry, Jaws does get exploded in the end. And this time round, when I watched it, I felt bad for him. I really mm. felt, I know he's not real, spoiler again, but I actually felt bad for the shark. But that's the thing, isn't it? Like, our perception of sharks has changed so much since 1975. At 1975, and this movie, like, formed our still today opinion of these beautiful creatures. Definitely. It, it, yeah, it didn't do a lot of good for sharks. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it also, I mean, it raised awareness of sharks massively. So I think a lot of, you know, a lot more people became oceanographers or whatever because of the film. A lot more people mm. didn't go and swim in the sea because of the film. And then a lot yes. more people were scared of sharks because of the film. So it worked on multiple levels. Yeah. It did indeed. Okay, right. Can we recall when we first saw Jaws and any memories of that first time or early memories of round about the time that you saw it? And it doesn't have to be the exact day. It can be kind of a ballpark. Um, let's start with Neil. Can you remember the first time that you saw it? I remember vividly. Um, I mean, I was too young to have seen it in the cinema first time out. Uh, so the first time I saw Jaws was on its own. Uh, it's a network TV premiere uh, in the UK. Oh. It, was it was shown on ITV um, and it came on right after Top of the Pops because we were watching Top of the Pops on BBC One. And I distinctly remember Barry Manilow was on Top of the Pops. And then we, I was like, <laughs> stop him and turn it over because George is going to start. <laughs> wow. So That's uh, awesome. I vividly remember that because to me, in my memory, that song is tied into the beginning of Jaws somehow because it was just like a quick flick on the, the TV thing of like, oh, and then Jaws is on. Um, and yeah, so it was full of it was full of adverts and stuff like that because it was on ITV. But I, I mean, I remember it because I was absolutely terrified. I mean, that's the, yeah. that's the first thing you remember. It's just I was shitting it. I, don't, I, I guess it must have been, I don't know, around about 1980 or something like that. So I was like 10 when I saw it for the first time. But yeah, terrifying. Cool. Jonathan, yeah, I... have you got a really cool, like, saw it in a, you know, a, a, a really cool lake setting or at the drive-in or something like that? I wish I did. I, for me, I know. I, this will be disappointing, but it's like, it's like these series of snapshots. It's like I was working my way up to it. Uh, when I was, um, it was 1981. Of course, the movie came out in 75 when I was like really, really, really young. So I didn't see it then. But in, in 81, there was a movie called Great White. And I think that it's known better as The Last Shark. Um, I think it was an Italian made movie. And it was showing and in America. And I was like seven. And this this kid that I spent the night with, his mom took us to see it. And like, I, I just saw it again recently. And it's and I don't think it's that great. But it's not that great. No, it's not. Okay, it's not. No, <laughs> it's really kind of you're laughing for the wrong reasons when you watch it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, but you know, to my seven year old self, it was just terrifying. I had to get up and walk out, and so like in my mind, I associated that with Jaws. So I had this fear of shark movies. Um, like Neil, it played on like uh, network TV in America in like 1982. I saw just bits and pieces on ABC. The scene that I saw, I remember so vividly. Um, it was John Williams's music that brought me into the room. And it was the scene where Brody and Hooper are out at night on the ocean looking at Ben Gardner's boat. Luckily, I left the room before Hooper goes into water because I think if I had seen that, I, I wouldn't have watched it for many years after. But I think finally it was when I was like a seventh grader. So like 1987, 88, that I just one day decided to watch it on my own. 
and I, I loved every moment of it. I, it was just incredible. So I was sitting in my grandpa's bedroom watching it on his TV. So nothing like a drive-in, but it was still a pretty transformative experience. Awesome. Alex, what about you? Uh, Were you in Bangkok? <laughs> Not this time. No, no. Uh, check out the Event Horizon episode. That was a lot of fun. No, I, I was in uh, Glorious Leeds, uh, twinned with Bangkok. And um, I was. Uh, it was on ITV. It's a bit like Neil was saying. It was on ITV. And I remember, like, I was obsessed with sharks. So, yeah, I was about five years old. And my mum was like, you're not watching Jaws. And I'm like, I am. I am. I want to watch Jaws. And she said, and I distinctly remember her going, well, don't say I didn't warn you. And I've since called her out on this because I'm like, I was five. Understanding <laughs> the concept of jeopardy was not in my vocabulary <laughs> at that point. So I, I, I watched it. And I, after that, I have never, never been in the sea since. I climbed out of the <laughs> swimming pool during my 25 meter swimming exam because I swore there was a shark in there. And for about 15 years, I couldn't have bubbles in the bath because I needed to see the bottom in case a trap door opened and a shark swam up and death. So, yeah, it had a pronounced effect on my existence. <laughs> yeah. That was really right. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, have any of you read the book as well? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, I take it that was all much later, obviously, because we all saw it quite young. Um, I'm, I'm round about the same. I probably saw it late 80s, so I would have been about seven or eight um and i read the book when i was about 11 um and the only thing i can remember from the book is that there's a lot more sex in it than obviously there is in the film <laughs> yeah who has a massive dick he's a massive dick in the book he sleeps with ellen Brody, and then you're like and when it's weird because when hooper gets eaten in the book spoiler if you haven't read the book but when hooper gets eaten in the book and the shark basically lifts him out of the water in its mouth and sort of parades him like it's prize you're like good on you shark what a dick <laughs> Yeah, they made, yeah, it has to be said they did make some good changes for the movie because <laughs> yeah. the, book, the, the book is 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 pure pulp. It's just a it's it's an airport read. It's like just yeah, it's really kind of cheap and nasty book. Um, but yeah, I read it shortly after seeing the film. I read it as a teenager or whatever. The thing I remember most about the book is the because I was like we, we, right to the very end of the book, and it's like the shark just kind of just suddenly stops. It just stops and sinks. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't noticeably get killed. It just simply stops and sinks. He's just like, what? Gives up. What the hell happened? Because <laughs> Peter, Peter Benchley, when Steven Spielberg was like, "Listen, uh, I know you've got that ending. What I'm going to do is I'm going to blow the shark up." And Peter Benchley was like, "Well, that, that would never happen." And Steven Spielberg famously goes, "Yeah, the thing is." I think I've got them by this point. So whatever I decide to do, they're going to go with me. So I'm going to yes. blow it up, Peter. Yeah, wasn't it, wasn't, it, um, wasn't it John Milius that suggested that he had to blow up the shark uh, in some discussion that they had? So you have to blow up the shark. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds yeah. like a Milius thing to say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the same in the same way in the same way John Millis goes. Yeah, I am. Um, I definitely wrote the Indianapolis speech, and everyone else goes. Well, that's not entirely true, John. Uh, he's, he's like, no, no, that's all me. People are like Robert Shaw kind of did it, really. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. Okay, um, right. Is there something that we each love specifically about the film? Um, whether it be a favorite character, a plot point, or a theme, or is it simply for you just an all-round appreciation of a perfect movie? So if we go in the same order again, starting with Neil. Um, what what I love about it is this this perfect uh, amalgamation of like blockbuster cinema meets seventies cinema, because it's very much a seventies film. It's you know it has stuff that, you know it's it's so character led, it's so character driven. It's it's got it's got like Watergate conspiracies and stuff like that kind of vibes into it, um, <laughs> and and it just has the the whole look and feel of a great seventies movie. It's got you know the cast, Roy Scheider, and a lot of great seventies actors, um, and yet it's this big blockbuster movie with 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 much bigger aspirations than that, um, and it's that it's that perfect blend that n no other film has in that way. I don't think. Yeah. I agree. I think that I think you captured the duality of Jaws really perfectly. And you, you use the adjective 
perfect. And I know that nothing that we create can ever be perfect. And when you get into film, it's such a collaborative journey with so many people doing so many jobs. You know, the, the, the possibility of, of mistakes or small flaws become, you know, it becomes greater. But I feel like Jaws is as perfect as a movie can be. Uh, for me, it's perfect. Um, and, despite, and, and, its, despite its flaws, because it, it does have them, plenty of them. Sure. You know, certain, on some of the shots, the shark does look totally convincing, and I, I buy it. There's at least one shot where it doesn't. Um, but you know, the, 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 but also like the weather continuity is for shit. Like the yeah. sea <laughs> continuity is all over the place. Um, the, it's blue skies one minute, gray skies the next, calm seas, rough seas, from shot to shot to shot. But you right. don't care. You no. absolutely don't care. You're so swept along in the story that you just don't care. And you know, yeah. I just pray to God that they never, never think of remaking it in any way. But uh, there you go. Anyway, sorry. Carry on. <laughs> it's, uh, no, it's, yeah, weird you, it's, it's weird you mentioned that Can continuity thing. There's a bit where the, one of the only things, and this is the only negative thing I'll say about it. There's one shot, and you, you've gone to sea with the guys. They're on the orca, and you feel... Like they're so far out in the open ocean. And then one shot, you can see land not that far away. It's just one shot. And I'm like, it ruins it for me because they, it stops the isolation. Yes. You think, oh, that's somebody that can swim to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, like they say about a car, you know, that might have some flaws, some dings, some rust or something. It's, it's got it where it counts. And I feel like that's Jaws. It's like every way that really matters, like story, the characters, Verna Fields is editing, uh, Bill Butler's framing, like the you know on, on a shot by shot, just the energy. Uh, John and John Williams' score, like I could just, I, I Spielberg gave that score half the credit for the success of the movie, and I don't know what the percentage actually would be, but I know that Williams' score is just so perfect and organic. I feel like it's another character in the film. Well, it so, is. It's so, it's so defining. And the way that it's used, the way Williams used it with the idea of, like, he only uses the theme when it is the shark and he doesn't use it when it's a fake. And that's the clue. Mm. And just little things like that, that the thought yeah. that went into it. The fact that I remember that I remember the first time I saw it was I, I felt a palpable sense of relief at that midway point when the shark starts eat, stops eating everybody on the beaches and they go out to hunt the shark and it was like oh my god thank god for that they're gonna go out and hunt the shark and the second half of the movie less plays less like a horror movie and more like a pirate adventure like it's a seafaring adventure or moby dick you know it's something totally different and has a different flavor to it and the music has a different flavor to it as well it becomes this swashbuckling kind of vibe to it um and yeah, this is, it's it's very much a film of two halves. I just I remember that the relief of like when they're heading out to sea and like, okay, they're gonna go and get the shark. You know, <laughs> and, and, the <laughs> and how how unexpected that score was, even even for Steven Spielberg, apparently, like he had one thing in his mind and he just left John Williams to it, and then John Williams goes, "Come in, I've got an idea," and just plays those two notes on a piano, like dun dun hmm. dun dun. And Steven Spielberg initially thought he was joking. He was like, that's very funny, John. What, what have you really got for me? And he was like, no, no, that's it. And trust me, it's going to be amazing. Because I think for me, it's the audacity of what they attempted to do with this movie. Just the, it's, either, it's either confidence or naivety to basically say, we are going to build an air pressure rig, a metal arm. We're going to mount a shark on it. And we're going to drop that in the bottom of the real ocean with all the salt and the kelp and the fish and everything and we, it's, it's never been done before we've never shot a movie at sea before but we're going to do that and it's going to work and and i mean it, it didn't work as it should have done but happy accidents and here we are talking about like you say a masterpiece but can you can you imagine the version of the film had the studio got their way and he'd shot it on the back lot you know hmm. right can you imagine what that would have been like it was just blue screen and oh Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. but, but that, that 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 naivety it just it, it fascinates me when you hear about the stories like that that famous story about Zanuck and Brown when they were like they were when they were like right we've got the rights to Jaws we're going to make this movie and initially they were like so and they started approaching uh, people going uh, we need to get a shark uh, it needs to be trained uh, to work with a dummy in the water and <laughs> they they at that point they literally thought there were trained sharks or they could train a shark and it was Peter eventually went what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
Hmm. Would, it wouldn't have had quite the same effect if the shark had been jumping through hoops and balancing <laughs> on. <laughs> oh, but do you know what? At some point, nobody came up with the idea of let's put a let's put like a trained sea lion in a shark suit. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, uh, you all know. I mean, I've got, it's like it's out there. But that that story about Carl Rizzo, the the jockey they used, uh, Ron and Valerie Taylor. That's that that. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, oh my God! That ter- every time I hear about that story, that's where they wanted to have a real person with sharks in a cage for the underwater shots, and and um, they were told there's no sharks as big as the one in your movie, and so they were like, we'll get a smaller person, a jockey. And he wanted to work in movies, and he'd never scuba dived. And they said, "Have you scuba dived?" And he said, "Yes." And so <laughs> when, right. it to, when it came to, yeah, he came, came to getting in the cage, and he was he was he was like really reluctant, and so he had to be convinced. And just as he's getting in, the a shark trashes that cage, and that's the bit you see in the movie. And yeah. it's only his his fear that stopped him dying. They were like, if he'd been in that cage, he would no longer be with us. <laughs> I, I, they did, I, I, but they did manage to get him in the water at some point because there is some footage of a, of him in, in, with the sharks. I, I think so. I must have talked him into it with a lot of money. I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. yeah, no, that that stuff is incredible. But it's, but it, it's it's kind of that same principle that they, he used later on in Jurassic Park of like mixing. Like real stuff, and you know, not re- not real stuff, but like practical and CG. Where in that in that time, he used real sharks with, you know, uh, little people, and then um, used the mechanical shark for other shots as well. And it, it paid off massively. Yeah, are there Absolutely. real dinosaurs in Jurassic Park? Then <laughs> that's right. Yeah, the real dinosaurs versus, and, and the animatronic ones I for the close up. So. Yes. <laughs> Train the shark and put it in a dinosaur suit. That's what it was. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, from a filmmaking point of view, Neil, um, did it take something like 170 days to finish, or or something ridiculous like that? How does that yeah. seem to? You? How how did it go on that long? Uh, how did it go on that one? Because they, they were managing to film like you know half an hour a day, or maybe in some days nothing at all. Because right. they were out on the out on the water, and it was just you know, they had to, and they were kind of making the script up as they kind of went along. I mean, it was organized chaos, but right. from it, you know, from it emerged this gem. But I mean, it could have so easily gone the other way, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, the other thing to bear in mind is like Spielberg was twenty seven, yeah, you know, when he made it, yeah, you know, I mean, and and that's like comparable to you know uh, Orson Welles doing. Citizen Kane when he was 23 or something <laughs> insane like that. I mean, these people are not normal people. They're kind of, they're no. total prodigies. <laughs> yeah, total definitely. prodigies who've done that. And, you know, um, I know that Spielberg fled the set at the end that he, 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 he didn't stay for the last shot because he knew the crew were going to throw him in the sea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, it was a marathon. It wasn't a sprint. It was a marathon. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't there for the when it got blown up, was he? He wasn't there for those bits. I remember something about that. Somebody else Maybe not. That. Maybe not. Yeah. But they, yeah. they ended up going and shooting the Ben Gardner's boat in Burnerfield's swimming pool. Or yes. Something like that. The head falling out of the boat. Stuff, yeah. stuff yes. like that. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think the crew weren't very happy. Apparently, that's where the, the, the famous quote, uh, you're going to need a bigger boat, came from. Because Roy Scheider um, had heard the crew uh, basically um, saying it. It was a, a phrase among the crew because the boats were not big enough to get the kit out to the ocean. And so they were like, you're going to need a bigger boat. And uh, and Roy heard that and started going, ah, oh, and dropped it in a few times in the film. And then obviously it made the cut where it makes the cut in that famous bit. But Verna Fields, like, apparently um, she and they never thought it was going to be funny until they actually saw it with an audience. That, that was not meant to be a funny line. And then they watched it with an audience and um, and everyone laughed. And then they had to bump up the volume on it to make sure they got the laugh because people were still talking from the shark appearing when he's chumming. And so they were still yeah. murmuring and reacting to that. And so they bumped up the volume on you're going to need a bigger boat to get that laugh. Ah, oh, yeah. very cool. They, they could have just cut it a bit. The thing that, I think that's one of the things that it, it doesn't get enough credit for is just how funny it actually is. Yes. Mm. I mean, yes. it's just the, the character, the banter between the characters and stuff like that is absolutely hilarious. 
Yeah. I just even some of the background detail. You can hear characters in the background talking about this, that, and the other, and things like that. And it's just it's just really funny stuff that's going on. I yeah. mean, it's, yeah. it's the very first scene with um, with Robert, uh, Robert Shaw when he appears, you know, with the fingers down the blackboard and stuff like that, and some of the yeah. some, of, some of the audience members like going, "Oh, that's not funny at all." All that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> oh, fu- it is funny. I'm sorry. It's yep. funny. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, I agree with that. W- watching it back again, it's um, yeah, it's just like you say, it's like the background characters that are just having these really just mundane, everyday conversations about some Boy Scouts that have been like knocking on the picket fences or and all these <laughs> really little tiny bits and pieces that just it seemed really funny. And at the time, everyone was just obviously just focusing on the action and all of that kind of stuff. But when you've watched it so many times and you can really appreciate all those little bits, it is, it is, yeah, and that. The bit on the blackboard is just horrific. <laughs> I hate that noise. <laughs> yeah, it's a fabulous picture of his shark. Uh, but there's also like weird things that you don't know whether it's a mistake or deliberate or whatever. There's the scene where um, Dreyfus is looking at the, bo- the the remains of of Chrissy in the box, and it starts the scene with like going, "Well, this is what happens." And then it's like, it's like, what, what, what happened? What, what are you talking about? Yeah. And then he just goes right. on and does something else. It's just like completely random lines yeah. like that to sort of show up. <laughs> so we, you talk about happy accidents and everyone's like, yeah, the shark didn't work. And Steven Spielberg's like, I would have half the movie if the shark had actually worked. So that's like one of the famous accidents. But even stuff like the nails down the blackboard, like he initially wanted to introduce uh, Quint um, in a cinema watching Moby Dick and laughing at Moby Dick. And um, and that was the big plan. That was Quint's introduction. And then Gregory Peck uh, went, absolutely not. I hate that movie. I'm not having that. I'm, I'm not proud of that movie. So you cannot use that movie. And so once again, <laughs> happy accident. We get nails down black. Definitely a happy accident. Yeah. yeah. I, I would think that an awful lot of it, you know, because because they had so much time sitting around when they couldn't film whatever to, to mull over the script and to work over it and work with the actors and stuff like that to come up with stuff. I think that definitely benefited the film massively uh, in terms of the performances, in terms of just the character arcs. And it's just so, it's so rich with character, the whole film. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's, 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 that, that's to me, that's, I think that's its lasting power more than anything, more than the shark attacks are fantastic. The shark sequences are fantastic. Um, but it's, it's those characters that you go back, you know, again and again and again and there's just those quotable lines about I'd love, love to get your name in the National Geographic, you know, all <laughs> yeah. that stuff. <laughs> that scene that's I, I feel like that's the biggest difference between the book and the movie it's like the the book benchley had game like he could write and i feel like the book just just the the little anecdotes i've heard is that there were it was more than just benchley that 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 ended up being responsible for the book that people have like there were other people meddling and saying you had to have this subplot or that specifically the hooper thing with uh, mrs brody but it's like the book has really effective suspense sequences like the shark attack scenes in the book are really scary they're really well done but it's all the character stuff that for me and I don't I don't like to criticize books because I know how hard they are to write, but it just doesn't work for me. The character stuff. I don't like Brody nearly as much as you alluded to, Alex. I hated Hooper. I was <laughs> so rooting for the shark, so ready for the shark to get him. And, and, and you know, the, it, it, just even the, the ending where the where you talked about the shark, I think, Neil, like just stopping. I was just as you were talking, I was imagining like in Dog Soldiers. What would happen if instead of, you know, like Spoon, the, the, the werewolf and Spoon, the werewolf just falls, right? Instead of having that incredible battle, right? It's like, yeah. how anticlimactic would that have been? That would have robbed us of this really rousing moment. And, and I think the same thing applies to Jaws. It's like you're just left scratching your head. You're like, what? That's the ending? He just dies? And, and for me, the parts, it's the most rewatchable movie Jaws is. And the reason why is the dialogue. Um, and you all have like kind of alluded to some of the scenes. That scene, I think it's like a one It's like this the, the shot with Brody, the mayor, and, and Hooper. And the mayor's being stubborn, right? Ignoring the problem, of course, as the mayor does. Yeah. And Hooper is saying, you're going to ignore this problem until it swims up and bites you. And uh, I won't finish the sentence. But like that whole sequence, it just thrums with energy. Like yeah. every dialogue sequence is 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 energetic, interesting. Um, it, they're funny. Like it's a like you said, they're a, it's a genuinely funny movie. Like I, I I laugh so often in the film, even the small moments when Brody and uh, Mrs. Brody and Hooper are having dinner, 
right? Just the, the running gag that Hooper can't get food. He can't find a meal on the island, so he takes Brody's food. It's like the little yeah. moments like that are so funny. And yeah. So I just, I never get tired of watching it because of all the character work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Those, those little beats, the little, the wonderful beat with him and his son, where his son's mimicking and doing all yes. the stuff. That's that, you know, that's that's the Spielberg magic in there. But then, as you say, the Warners, you know, that that Warner, the the Warner on the on the ferry when they're crossing, you know, he's, and, and um, the mayor's talking to him on the ferry, you know, just as a single camera setup. It's just like simple stuff like that. He does a lot of that in the film, and it's beautiful. And let's not forget the guy who goes, it's a what? That's my favorite line in the whole thing. It was just brilliant. He made the most of his line, didn't he? Like, he oh, really yeah. nailed it. <laughs> amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, and is that true to the accent like, of Martha's Vineyard and all around there, Jonathan? Do you know? I, 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 I know I've been to Boston, so I've heard like the R's, like the yard and stuff. Is that how they speak around there? <laughs> Honestly, I don't even know. I'd love to go someday, but I've never been there, so I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, I was hoping I'd love you've to go. been there. I'd love to go as well. I mean, because of the legacy that it's left in that community, because of all the people, all those people like um, Ben Gardner, obviously a, a local fisherman called yep. Craig Kingsbury, who who um, who basically Robert Shaw based Quint on, and um, and by all accounts, um, <laughs> by all accounts, um, Craig Kingsbury was something of a, a yarn spinner, and he just made up stuff. And there's a wonderful <laughs> interview where Robert Shaw is on camera repeating something that Craig Kingsbury told him uh, as fact to a journalist. He's going, uh, you know, um, uh, the biggest crime in Martha's Vineyard is uh, incest. Uh, it's not true. Not true. Craig Kingsbury <laughs> told Robert Shaw that. Robert Shaw repeated it as fact. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So do you all have a favourite character or is it hard for you to be able to pick? N Neil, have you got a favourite? Um, oh, that, that is difficult. That is a difficult one because each of them is so individual and they, they represent so... I mean, you know, I, I love Quint. Who doesn't love Quint? But, <laughs> um, you know, because... Um, yeah, I'd, have to, I'd probably have to go with Quinn. Yeah. I think mm. so. Yeah. I mean, it's yep. got to help your movie if you've got two characters that are in conflict and the actors actually hate each other. That's another happy yeah. accident right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I would take the other character in that conflict. Uh, for me, it's Hooper. I, I love all the characters um, and I love, I love Brody's journey, but it's Hooper that I love the most. I just feel like in it, there's so many details he um, he's like this perfect blend of sarcasm and like morality. He, he comes to the island. And again, it's so opposite of what he does in the book. In the book, he shows up and starts staring at Mrs. Brody. In the movie, he shows up and starts trying to help. Right. Yeah. And he actually knows what he's talking about, yeah. unlike everybody else. So and, and, and when he when he really dresses down the coroner. When he says, well, this was no boating accident. It's like the audience, it's like we feel vindicated. We're like, yes, finally somebody's saying it. Somebody's telling the truth. Um, and, you know, he's also this perfect combination of there's a scene, there's a line where Quint says, take him for ballast, chief. Hmm. And, and I looked up ballast and, you know, I know it's a seafaring term. But one thing ballast can be is like it can balance the ship a little bit or help the ship be more seaworthy. That's Hooper. Hooper, he knows exactly. I mean, he knows a lot about, you know, all things nautical. He's been on yachts and America's Cup and all that stuff. But he also has a healthy respect and fear of sharks where Quint is so gung ho. He decorates in shark jaws are everywhere. Right. He just wants to kill. Um, Hooper actually respects these animals. He doesn't despise these. He thinks they're beautiful, right? He's taking pictures and, oh, you're beautiful. You're beautiful. So it's like Hooper is that perfect balance between the landlubber Brody, who's who's terrified of water, and then Quint, who's so like monomaniacally obsessed with killing. I just, for me, Hooper is a master class of both like writing and acting. You got city hands, Mr. Cooper. Been counting money all your life. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I, that bit, that bit to take both, both, uh, both your favorite characters, but that bit where Quint 
He's wrecked the orca, he's wrecked the engine, they're floating in the ocean, and he finally has to swallow his pride and just sort of looks at all Hooper's kit and the cage, and he's like, what does this stuff do, Mr. Hooper? And you're like, oh, that must sting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, yeah. No, it's, yeah that, that conflict between the two of them, the fact that even resorts to face pulling is... Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to take any much of more of this abuse. Yeah, it's great. It's, uh, that yeah. is great. <laughs> I, I was with you. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Jonathan. Hooper was my favorite. Um, I just, I, I, I love him. And that, that's sort of, I know he, he, he does respect the animals. Uh, he respects sharks, but there's also that sort of little bit of like, he almost respects them too much. Like he thinks he understands them. The scene that you were mentioning, I think early on, Neil, where, where he goes out in his boat that he owns big surprise and um and then he's like he just gets in the water and I, I, for me one of my fears of the water where i've never been in the sea is captured in that moment with the lights under the surface and it's just so black and it's like you just don't know what's down there and when he gets in in the diving kit i'm just like oh man and then sure enough he gets he gets the fright with the famous ben gardner head situation it's sort of at that moment and he sees the size of the tooth at that moment, I think he perhaps starts to realize this might not just be a regular day at the shark office for him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely. I agree with that. Um, I love all of the characters as well, but it, for me, uh, just to be different, it's Brody. Um, and whether that is because he's a police officer quite possibly um but my my only bugbear with this film and i absolutely love it is and again i don't know what the weather is really like in martha's vineyard on the 4th of july but i i when i've been to america i literally sweating buckets when i even get off the plane and they're all wearing like coats and stuff you know and jumpers and things but it's the 4th of july on the beach would they not would it would it not be really hot uh, it's the 70s. <laughs> it was colder then, was it? But, oh, that, well, that whole beach. Yeah. <laughs> that beach scene's my favorite moment in the whole movie. It's after the 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 the, the, the fake out with the kids with the shark fin. And then I, I, it's it's such a minor moment. It's no one's favorite moment in Jaws, I don't think, apart from uh, mine. Um, maybe not. But um, but they've just uh, they've just caught these kids, and then that girl sees the actual shark entering the pond, and she just can't get the words out, and she's like, yeah. "Shark, sh shark, <laughs> shark!" And Brody's like, "Now what?" And Ellen Brody's like, <laughs> "Michael's in the pond," and that, I was like, "Goosebumps!" Just talking about, it, and he does the run. Yeah. I'm just like, that whole sequence just is just magnificent. That uh, is great with the with the leg floating down. Oh yeah, isn't he the creepiest man in the world? That guy in the boat. I'm like, well, he is troubling. Uh, I've always thought that. No one's gonna miss him. Like, are you all right, boys? You having fun over there? It's like, who are you meant to be? Uh, he, he was he was he was played by the stuntman Ted Grossman, um, who showed up. He, and he shows up in ET. Shows up in the Goonies. He's a frozen corpse in a fridge in the Goonies. Oh, the FBI wow. agent. That's amazing. Wow. 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 <laughs> Good intel. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Love I that fact. So leading on from that, um, because you are all mega fans um, and all have film experience does anyone else have any like really good things like that to to share something that possibly and i want to hear about this gun thing as well alex from you <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so um jonathan i know that you um because you teach film at school and jaws is one of the things that you use to teach with your students is there anything that you've come across in that that's like a really good fact that you like to tell them I'm sure that Spielberg has talked about this somewhere and it's possible that I, that I just, I think that often we like look at something and we read something into it that maybe wasn't intended. Right. But that's kind of the beauty of, of, of books and movies, right? Yeah. Like that they're kind of become personal to us. Um, but there's a moment where one of my favorite scenes, one of my favorite suspense scenes, like in all, in fact, I teach, so I do a Hitchcock unit early in the semester and then Jaws is kind of in the middle and I liken this scene to the shower scene in Hitchcock's Psycho, but it's the scene, the Alex Kintner scene, um, where the boy gets gets killed. Um, just prior, like the, the entire sequence, like th there's a documentary of the making of Jaws and Spielberg talks a lot about a lot of elements, 
But what I love is um, he he foreshadows what happens to Alex so well. And they say that like a motivated character is an interesting character. And, and I, I believe that wholeheartedly. And I think that scene is is his fuel for the rest of the movie. I think that that's where he becomes so, inv- because he has Alex's blood on his hands. Like there's a great moment later where Mrs. Kittner says, or where the mayor tries to let him off the hook, right? I'm sorry, Martin, she's wrong. After Alex Kittner's mom walks away and he mm-hmm. says, no, she's not. Mm-hmm. And yes. by the way, that's also when we see Hooper in this lingering reaction shot, looking at Brody, he's like, okay, so this guy is flawed, but he's also like different than the mayor because he actually owns his mistakes. But there's a moment in that beach scene where Alex, after he asks his mom if he can go back out in the water, and she makes that, I mean, Spielberg, by the way, he makes that as painful as possible. And the screenwriters make it as painful as possible because, you know, it's one of those decisions as a parent. There's no way she could know where that would lead. But, you know, she's going to second guess herself. If only if only I had said no, if only if I had kept him on the beach, that wouldn't have happened. So it's it's as much of a gut punch as possible. After he gets permission, he's walking. We, we, we cut to Brody or we follow um, Alex up to Brody. Brody's in the foreground. Alex is back here. And Alex like climbs up onto this little deck and it looks like he climbs inside Brody's brain. Like he climbs inside his head. He wow. disappears into Brody's head in the foreground. And it's like, that's what happens in the scene. That's why Brody pursues this, even though his worst fear is, is drowning. He is not going to stop until some resolution is, 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 is brought about. He's going to try to kill this shark. So I, I just love that shot by Spielberg. Like you talked about, Neil, he's 27 when he made that movie. It's like Mozart. It's like there's no accounting for that kind of skill and yes. artistry. I just, I just I watch it in awe because I see something new like that every time I watch it. It's extraordinary. That's brilliant. Yeah, that, that, it is like Mozart. For, mm. that, that scene for me, though, triggers something else. It's like, for me, the whole film is about avenging the death of Pivot. Pivot the dog. The dog. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Oh my God, he's the biggest casualty of the Kitna boy's death because everyone forgets about Pippet. Pippet. Nobody gives a shit about Pippet. It's a Pippet. Uh, that, his dog, it's just the guy. It's the, that image of his owner just shouting his name out to sea, holding the stick, is possibly the most tragic image in Jaws. It's heartbreaking. Yes, it really is. That's true. That think, is think, very true. It is. Yes, and I think Werner yeah, Fields. Yeah, I think Verna Fields got that, and Spielberg maybe too, because he edited it with he edited the movie with her. But like they cut from Alex to Pippet, like over mm-hmm. and over early in the scene, right? You cut here, mm-hmm. then you cut here. There's one moment where their paths literally cross, where um, Alex or the dog splashes into the water when Alex comes out. Like they are like visually aligned. So I really feel like even though people don't talk about the dog as much, that like that's I totally agree. I think his mm-hmm. it's it's such a tragic little death. And P- P- yeah. Pivot ended up as a starter. He was yeah. just like a <laughs> starter before the main course. <laughs> yeah, <an> appetizer, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, in, 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 in terms of watching uh, Alex Kittner floating on the lilo from below, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's, that's my thing about not going in the sea. It's not knowing that that thing, it could be anything, is just below you. I, to, paraphrase, to paraphrase Quint, I'll never get on a lilo again because of that moment. <laughs> it's interesting about that that sequence is like you you it never ceases to amaze me how shocking it is mm-hmm. of how graphic it is of the, the little kid and the gouts of blood everywhere and stuff like yeah. that. And it's like, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that before or since, like of a of a kid being killed in such a graphic mm-hmm. way in a movie, in a mainstream yeah. movie at that. Um, you know, it's, it's and it's even more it's, disturbing because you. Work. You can't quite work out what the shape is because I think there was a, there was another version that was shot after Spielberg left by Joe Alves, and there's a still that does the rounds online all the time with the whole yeah. shark's head coming out and looming over him, and they were like, "That's that's too much." And I think it's one yeah. of those where the less you show, and it's just you sort of see yeah. this fin, and you're not quite sure what you see, but you see the blood. It's dis- you're right. I, it's so disturbing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's yeah, it's it, it kind of it's backlit, and you just kind of see this weird shape, kind of. Mm-hmm turn over in the water and yes. like, what the hell was that and then then and then then the kid comes out of the water and back in again and whatever it's the, the blood everywhere it's like fucking hell i mean that doesn't traumatize <laughs> you as a kid i don't know what, what does <laughs> and, and there's other although there's other deaths in the film that is the one that was sticks in your mind it's like because it's a kid but yeah. you know ballsy very ballsy definitely what about the uh the dolly shot neil 
I mean, how did they do that? And isn't that that didn't that come from Hitchcock originally? The bit where they do like the close up front of. I don't know. I'd have to see who was the first person to do it. But um, but I mean, Hitchcock made it famous in Vertigo, um, yeah. and you know, and other directors have done it since, including myself. I've nicked it. <laughs> it's such a great uh, it has, to be, it has to be done. Yeah, the, it, of the. You're either uh, tracking in or and zooming out at the same time, or vice versa, depending on what the effect is you want to get. Um, and so, yeah, and that one, that one is textbook. I mean, it really is, and it just it, it hits at just the right moment. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful shot. But that it's whole sequence, certain. that build up where that Werner feels that like, used all the the people crossing camera yeah. to edit the scene together. It's just oh, it's it's stunning. It definitely it's, is. Yeah. Yeah. It can now be where I make it really awkward because when when we first we got on the Zoom together, Alex, you were the you were the the fourth one to get on here. But when Neil came on, I was like trying to like you have your, we always have interior monologue going on. I'm like, oh, be cool, be cool, don't, don't be an idiot. I'm like, hey, Neil, <laughs> this guy, he is you're the you're the director of two of my top ten horror movies of all time. So I just want to I I love I just love your filmmaking so much, <laughs> yes. and I. I I was gonna say that when I when you came on, but I just got tongue tied. I'm just trying to be, hey, hey man, how you doing? <laughs> like, oh my gosh, this is Neil. This is the guy. I've been like showing and re-showing. I use dog soldiers in class. Um, I use it for. How do you use dog soldiers in class for? <laughs> Your, the opening scene, the the characterization of um of uh, Kevin McKidd, like the way that he's introduced, okay. his All refusal right. to shoot the dog. I stopped before the thing happens with the dog. But I just I, I I feel like it's like so well done, like it's it, you ju- immediately we start out we get to know this guy and I I feel like we care about him from that point afterward, um and I just I, and that's obviously just one scene that you've done but I I've just loved your filmmaking for years and years and years and you're amazing so I've just made it awkward sorry but thank you very much I'm I'm I'm, I'm honored I really am. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but uh, hang on, because I, I was just like checking the time, and I don't, we don't want to run out before we hear the story from Alex about the gun. I want to know what yes, the gun story. Got about is. ten oh. minutes, so come on, Alex. We need your oh, gun okay. story. Um, I, it may have been built up too much, so I'm I'm on the set yeah. of the <laughs> the Equalizer Two, uh, the not so much loved sequel with Denzel Washington, just outside of Boston, doing a few interviews, and I get to interview the props guy, and he's like, "Oh, these are just some of the weapons that uh, Denzel uses in the movie," and he gives me this harpoon gun, and I'm like, "Oh, okay, don't don't think anything of it." And he uh, he had no idea that Jaws was my favorite film, and he goes, uh, "Yeah, by the way, um, uh, that's the uh, the harpoon gun from Jaws." And I lost my shit <laughs> to the level that this guy was terrified. He didn't know what was going on. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, yes, I have held Quint's harpoon gun from Jaws. That's Probably. my story. That's yeah. a good one. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you run? Did you get it and then just leg it? And then no, he never saw you again. It, it's hanging up uh, in your I, head. I, I did. I did the fake. I did the fake out. I did the run. But then he looked genuinely because of my reaction that I may continue running. So I was like, "I'm joking, of course, professional." <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It was a it was a big moment in my life. I was like, "Wow, that's special." Oh, that's awesome, Neil. Have you been to Martha's Vineyard when when you lived in the states? Did you go up there? No, I never never got up there. I did. I did go to Universal Studios to see the old Jaws. You know the thing they had there, which isn't there anymore. They've got rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. But you know when you're on the mini the, the 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 train thing and the shark comes up next to the car and stuff, uh, that was that was pretty cool. <laughs> that was I nice. did the ride in Florida. That's not yeah. there either now. But uh, that yeah, that's as close as I've got. And the the the, the ride in uh, Universal uh, Studios in Florida was brilliant as well because it was a proper like boat ride that you went out on and then the shark came up right. at the end. It was brilliant. Um, I think one of the, the last times that I saw Jaws was at the Hollywood Bowl. Uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, the last time I saw it on the big screen, anyway, with a live orchestra, which was pretty amazing. Wow! Um, wow. Yeah, pretty great experience. And I, I know in Martha's, I mean, for years, because like I've looked up the locations for it and thought, you know, maybe I should go to Martha's Vineyard. Um, I know the remains of the orca were like washed up on it; they were on a beach for years. But I think slowly but surely they've just like disappeared because mm-hmm. um, they just they just drove the boat up onto a beach at the end of the film and just left it there. And it just yeah. just rotted away slowly but surely. So I don't know. What, I don't know what left that would be recognisable in terms of locations. 
Speaking of the end of the film, uh, the one story that I love, uh, and it possibly Spielberg's only bad idea in the movie, which is why it didn't make it in, but after the shark's blown up and Hooper and Brody are paddling back to shore, Spielberg wanted a school of shark fins to appear on the horizon and start heading towards them. And it was uh, Richard Zanuck was like, absolutely not, Stephen. Go and sit down. Can you, um, after, after going through that, you want that to be the laugh at the end where it's like, uh-oh, more sharks. Wow. Oh, brilliant. Okay, cool. Um, what are we, uh, so, what are we uh, think of the sequels while we're on? What was what that, we sorry? Of, what do we think of the sequels? Yes, yeah, go, a, go for it. Yep. I struggle to watch Jaws now because of how cute Sean is, knowing what happens at the start of Jaws the Revenge, because I, it, it's possibly the only good ish scene in Jaws the Revenge where Sean. Brody dies at the very start because his arm fucking ripped off. It's like, and you just watch Jaws now and you think, that's your end, mate. You're going <laughs> to get your arm ripped off by, Ven I think the shark is called Vengeance because I think in the, in the Jaws books, Vengeance, the, jaw, the shark in Jaws Revenge is the offspring of the sharks in Jaws 1 and Jaws 2, which is why it's got this vendetta. That. Yeah, I can't. I haven't seen the, the Jaws of Revenge for years. But is it in that one, or is it in Jaws 3D that the shark roars? It's, like oh a, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's four. It's it's, it's yeah, Jaws the Revenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no. Oh, amazing! <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I, actually, I actually, there's a lot in Jaws 2 that I like. It's it's Jaws 2 becomes more like a it's a shark slasher movie. It's like. It's it's Jaws meets Friday the Thirteenth. So it's like a bunch of annoying teenagers who are just itching to get eaten by the shark. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but it has a similar kind of vibe to it. The look of the film is similar to the first one, and there's a couple of good moments. The water skiing sequence is pretty good. Um, things like that. The, but uh, the, oh, the idea of the shark and the, yeah, the helicopter and the, the shark and uh, had a fight with a killer whale, and the killer whale lost because mm. it's like a badass shark. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. awesome. Um, okay, so we, we've got around about five minutes. Um, I just wanted to ask um, particularly um, Jonathan and Neil on this one. Um, if you have used anything in your own creative work, which is a direct influence from Jaws. So um, if we start with Jonathan, in any of your books, have you done anything that is a direct influence well, I wrote an entire novel called Amity uh, yes, during yes. Uh, yes. during lockdown uh, over here, and I have done nothing with it. Nobody has read it. I haven't shown it to my pre-readers, to my agent, to my manager. I haven't showed it to anybody because I like, <laughs> so it's like I, I decided to, do, you all probably heard some of these titles, but like Love Boat and um uh, I don't know. I mean, there are these big disaster movies of the 70s that I saw when I was little, like 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 Towering Inferno. Um, there's one. There's a movie called Airport. Yeah. And then Poseidon there are TV Adventure. shows. Poseidon Adventure. There are TV shows like Love Boat and Fantasy Island. And I felt like I wanted to bring a big cast to a novel that paid homage to Jaws. And that's what? Amity, where they try to create this. Yeah, they try to create they try to recreate Amity as a not just as an amusement park, but they try to make this whole island into Amity Island in my book, right, as a tourist attraction. And um, it's like a thriller. It's my only non-supernatural book so far. But I just, I, at, at the end of it, I, it's, it gets so wild and, and outlandish that I'm just afraid for anybody to read it. So I, I'm not like, I'm not, oh. I, I'm not fishing for people to try to ask for it or anything like that. I'm just saying that's definitely the most Jaws connected thing that I've written. Anyway, y'all go ahead. <laughs> oh, I just want to say that I remember you writing it during lockdown and that you need to do something with it because your work is amazing. And so okay. that will be as well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Neil. Um, I think probably, and not consciously, but I think probably that the le the lesson that I learned from Jaws was about like, keeping keeping the monster hidden, uh, and and sort of I applied that very much to to Dog Soldiers and Descent or whatever is like keeping the creatures hidden as much as possible until the end. 
uh, maybe blowing the house up at the end of, of Dog Soldiers was like, you know, it has to blow up just like the mm. shark. But <laughs> beyond that, I mean, I can't consciously thinking of anything I've specifically put in that relates to them. Oh, well, uh, no, hang on. What am I talking about? Blatant copying of um, Sean's speech in Dog Soldiers. Yes, it's like, yes. <laughs> I was going to have to, I was going to say, come okay. on. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that one. Yeah, complete, <laughs> complete ripple. Uh, I wanted Sean to have a Quint speech. <laughs> <laughs> do it do something different with it make it kind of weirdly macabre and funny <laughs> mm. it's great i love that moment in dog soldiers it's so good and it's like, like again it, it's the same for spielberg like the confidence to sort of go and everything stops and we're just going to listen to one person talk yes. it's, it's such a good moment now yeah but then, and then, then when spielberg had the boat you know the shark attacked the boat after his speech I had a cow drop on the fly. Yeah, that moment is special, though, in Dog Soldiers. Like, you know, that everything about that scene is so special. And I think the same thing applies to Quint's monologue in Jaws. Well, I, think just saying, have... I think in both cases, it's down to the person who's doing the speech. You know, I think it's down to, to Robert Shaw and, and, and Sean Perry. Sean was amazing. Oh my gosh, he's amazing in that in that whole movie, but that speech particularly, yeah, it's so good. But I, I feel like they have a similar chill-inducing effect on the well, viewer. They both, have, they both have really cool voices. That yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Janine, are you amazed that this is the second podcast in a row that has become a Sean Pert we love in? Because that was the last one. Yeah, <laughs> well. It's my thing. It's, yeah, from now on, only people that are going to be um, waxing lyrical about Sean Pert we are allowed on, basically. Mm. <laughs> you have to I'm sign a statement. Mm. The conversation <laughs> come back to Sean at the end. Yeah, <laughs> always. Because Sean is just our hero and we love him. <laughs> and Alex stalks him more than I do, if that's even a, a, a believable yeah, thing. So, yeah, yeah it's, exactly. it's troubling. I mean, he, 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 it, I don't think I'm going to get away with it again. It's about being four times in a row. Well, I'll just trap him in a bar and start chewing his ear off about everything he's been in Dog Soldiers, Event Horizon, just like, John, John tell me this. What was it like? And it, bless him, he's always happy to ta talk about it, or at least he acts happy to talk talk about it let's take that one to stop bothering <laughs> okay quickly to wrap up then um because we've only got a couple of minutes so just to tell people where they can find you jonathan what's the best place to find you and your books yeah i'm i'm on all the social media things. So Jonathan Jans on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, all those hellscapes. I can be found anywhere. Uh, you can find my books basically anywhere. Amazon. If you don't like Amazon, look wherever else. It, it'll be there. So just look me up. I'm pretty accessible. Awesome. Neil, where can people find you? Uh, really just on, on Instagram. Uh, you know, Neil Marshall, director. I'm, I'm there. Easy to find. <laughs> It's my, my sole focus on Instagram. I don't, I don't tweet. I don't do anything else. Just Instagram. <laughs> awesome. And Alex, what's the best place to find you? Uh, Alex uh, underscore Zane on Twitter and just Alex Zane on Instagram. And uh, I've got a couple of podcasts that, uh, Neil, I need to speak to you, uh, but also uh, a, a trip to the movies uh, at trip to movies pod and clash of the titles at clash pod. Uh, uh, very good things that I do, yeah. I think. <laughs> they are. They are very, very good, definitely. I can definitely yeah. attest to that. <laughs> they're, they're so good, by the way, Alex. I had I didn't know you, all right? And then and then when Janine like mentioned you were going to be on here, I'm like, I know this guy's – I know Neil's filmmaking. I don't know Alex. So, and no, no offense at all. I just didn't know you before this. No. So I like looked you up, and I started to watch you. And it was a really bad idea because you're so good at what you do. You're like so engaging and so funny and so articulate that it made me nervous. And I was like, why did I watch that? I'm like, now, I'm, now I'm even more nervous. I was nervous to meet Neil. Now I'm nervous because of Alex because he's going he's gonna to sound so much more intelligent. And anyway, you're excellent at what you do, but I kind of wish you weren't. I mean, now I'm happy, but last night I was wishing you weren't very good. Thank you, Jonathan. That's very kind of you, mate. Thank you. Hang on a minute, you've given them loads of praise. Well, I, you've given me the you know longest. You. you know I love you, Janine. That, 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 that's understood. That goes without saying. That's all right. Bringing people together. Bringing people together. <laughs>
Okay, uh, thank you ever so much for all coming on and um, talk to you all soon. Farewell and adieu to your first Spanish lady.